Good morning and welcome to the Florida Supreme Court. The first case on our docket today is Deviney versus the state of Florida. Counsel? Thank you, Chief. May it please the court, Mose Bracey on behalf of Mr. Deviney. I hope to focus on issue one. I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Yes, sir. I hope to focus on issue one in particular um, as it relates to the denial of cause challenge as to prospective juror Henderson. With that in mind. Only prospective juror Henderson or Sutherland also? I'm sorry, Justice Lagoa? With respect to just uh, Henderson or also Sutherland? Um, I hope to focus on just uh, on juror Henderson, okay. although I'd be happy to address juror Sutherland as well. It's your argument. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. With that in mind, on one level, this case is about granting a single litigate a remedy to which he's entitled under repeatedly reaffirmed precedent. But on a deeper level, this case is about honoring our entire legal system's commitment to stability in the law. And I hope to make five main points. Briefly, number one, a cause for challenge should be granted if there's a reasonable doubt that a juror is impartial. That's sufficient. By the same token, establishing beyond a reasonable doubt that a juror is partial is not necessary. Two, an unqualified predisposition to impose death for premeditated murder is a view that prevents or at least substantially impairs a prospective capital juror's performance of their duties in accordance with their oath and instructions. Can I, can I back up just a little yes, bit sir. on the first point? The reasonable doubt standard or the doubt standard that you articulated, yes, that's sir. the standard for which trial judges are to evaluate whether someone should be struck for cause or not. Yes, sir. Okay, what is our review? This court's review, the standard of review, is manifest error, which this court has said is tantamount to abuse of discretion. Right, so it, it, essentially if there's some competent substantial evidence supporting the trial court's determination, we're not gonna find that there's an abuse of discretion. Is that fair? I, I would disagree with that, Justice okay. Luck. I, I, I would suggest, and, and here I'm drawing on, um, in particular, a case uh, that I've read, Burns v. United States, that this court has cited to in Booker before, but I think the general notion is that even when a trial court has some measure of discretion, they still have to conscientiously and reasonably apply the appropriate legal standards to the particular facts of sure. the case. Sure. If the trial court states that they've heard all the evidence and they believe the juror can be fair and there is competent substantial evidence in the record to support that finding, would we find that, have we ever found that to be an abuse of discretion? Um, I, w I would hesitate to say absolutely yes or no. I, I mean, I'd be interested to see the case where yes, we sir. did. Uh, but I, I guess my, my ultimate question is, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to cut you off because I know you wanted to make five points and you were making your second one when I interrupted, but um, I if we find or look in this record that there is competent substantial evidence, although there are statements one way and statements the other way, but there are statements indicating that one could be fair and consider mitigating and aggravating circumstances and not impose death automatically, isn't that sufficient for us to affirm and find that the trial court did not abuse its discretion, even though we as trial judges may not have made the same call? I would say no, Justice Luck, and, and, and here's why, if I could elaborate. I mean, my third point w is that here the trial court arbitrarily and unreasonably denied the cause challenge as to Juror Henderson. And, and here's why I would say that, first of all, um, first of all, this court has said, including in cases such as Hayes versus State, that even though a trial judge is entitled to a large degree of discretion in ruling on juror challenges, the standard of review is not a mechanism by which the trial court's ruling is rubber stamped. And, and, and along those lines, this court has said that deference does not imply a let me Let me ask it this yes, way, and I, I don't have any sites, but I, I believe that there are a number of cases in which appellate courts have correctly said that there are statements that are made by jurors that simply cannot be rehabilitated. So even though the juror may have said, well, of course I can follow the law, of course I can <clears throat> be fair and impartial, that we would reverse um, and or, or determine that the cause challenge should have been granted because so it, it because of other statements that were made, that it just wasn't rehabilitatable. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And, and I would say in that circumstance, Justice Lawson, I'm thinking of 
For instance, this court's de decision in Hill versus State, where the, this court basically said, if a juror says, I can set aside my bias and render a verdict based solely on the evidence and the law announced, even in that circumstance, a cause for challenge should be granted if it's clear that the opinion will not readily yield to the evidence. And, and that is a quote, readily yield. And, and so I certainly, I certainly agree that the standard of review here is critical. And, and, and generally speaking, I, I certainly agree with your but, point, but Justice Lawson. I, I guess to that, but to that point in discussing what, what Justice Lawson just asked, it, it seemed like Mataran's cleared a lot of that stuff up. In other words, what Mataran said is that line of cases about not being able, just saying I can be fair after being browbeaten, um, although having said that you can't be fair a lot earlier in that, went to immutable characteristics. Those things that were immutable to the, the juror. For instance, in Mataran's it was that person had been a victim of the same exact crime for which the defendant was, was being charged. And the court said that that's immutable to that particular juror. They can't be expected to set that aside, especially after articulating that they couldn't. These are legal issues. In other words, the, the, the one's view on the, on the application of the death penalty is a legal error that jurors just don't understand exactly how the death penalty applies. And Mataran seemed to suggest, I thought, that those are exactly the sort of things that can be rehabilitated. In other words, that can be subject to a discussion and education by the court and the parties to a juror. Yes, sir. Is that not the case? Well, I do think that is true with, re with respect to Matarance. I, I, I think I, I could say this for purposes of our discussion on this point, it is accepting every point that, that, that the court has said, pointed out so far with respect to the standard of review. I would point out that here, after the state's attempt at rehabilitation, prospective juror Henderson said this, premeditation is the biggest factor for me. If the thought was present prior to the actual act, I could not vote for life, it would be death. And then immediately thereafter, the defense attorney essentially said, so juror Henderson, in a case like this, you would either have to vote for life or, or death. And you're basically saying, if Mr. Devaney was convicted of premeditated murder, your vote would be for death. Is that correct? That is correct. And so I do think that while the standard is deferential, there still has to be some meaningful review with some teeth. And, and, and here, I think that the fact that that's where prospective juror Henderson ended up after the state's attempt at rehabilitation is, is extremely significant, is extremely significant. And, 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 and I would argue that here the trial court, well, first of all, the trial court failed to explain its ruling. And of course, the trial court doesn't have to explain its ruling, but that can help the appellate court determine whether he, prop, he or she properly exercised their discretion. And as this court pointed out in Busby, in circumstances like this where the trial court fails to explain its ruling, then the appellate court has offered no insight into the prospective jurors, the certainty with which they answered provided their answers or their candor. And as a result, the appellate court is, is entitled to rely on the answers as they appear in the record. And of course, what else could the appellate court do? They have to rely on how, how the answers appear. And so here, what, what can, yes, sir. What, what can the trial judge add that would be helpful? I mean, facial ex expressions, uh, what can the trial judge add? Yes, sir. I, I think that, for instance, the trial court could say, well, the prospective juror appeared to be perhaps confused um, by this answer or that answer, or um, he, he seemed clearly to, 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 to be clear on this particular point. Um, I, I recall one particular uh, trial lawyer that appeared before me and, and during jury selection when defense attorney, when he got up to speak to the jury, uh, first question out of his mouth without saying anything, Mr. So-and-so, are you going to make my client testify before you can find him not guilty? And most people, without being educated about the law, would say, well, yeah, I mean, I, I want to hear from him. And then approach judge, I got a challenge for cause. Uh, and, and then once you explain to the juror or the court or perhaps uh, someone else, the prosecutor, explain to the juror how it works, and then, well, of course, I'll follow the law. Yes. And, and, and you see how that works? Uh, uh, and, and sometimes with a death penalty, it is easier, you know. I mean, I, you could never give the death penalty, ever, 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 never. Well, what about if Adolf Hitler was on trial? Could you get the death penalty then? Uh, that kind of thing. Yes, sir. Uh, and and that's, that's a concern 
Yes, sir. Uh, uh, as, and then once a juror is educated or someone explains to the juror what the law is, then the next step is you know, how do we know or how does the trial court know, well, he really means it, that uh, I've been educated, I know what the law is, I can really follow the law, or whether I'm just saying that because that's what I hear everybody else saying. Yes, sir. And that's the problem with laying the responsibility in the trial judge to somehow <laughs> determine whether this person is really, you know, being uh, honest about his or her feelings about the law. Yes, sir. Well, well Justice LaBarga, the thing about this case is there's no doubt that Juror Henderson understood his duties. In fact, during the time at which the state attempted rehabilitation, the state told him, now you understand that, could, could you follow the law? Yes. You understand that death is never required, right? Yes, I do. Could you impose death in an appropriate case? Yes. Do you understand that death is not automatic? I do. And so could you weigh the mitigating evidence and balance it? I could. And then immediately thereafter, the defense attorney stands up and says, so Mr. Henderson, in a hypothetical case where a defendant is convicted of first degree murder, whether it's premeditated murder or felony murder, could you ever vote for life imprisonment? And that's when he said, premeditation is the biggest factor for me. If that thought was present prior to the actual act, I could not vote for life, it would be death. And, and that is after, that's towards the end of jury selection, after the judge had started out by explaining the duties, after the state attorney had, yes and sir. After he, after he said that, did he do anything to back away from that specific statement? I mean, he'd made the general statements that were, you know, follow the law, but then it comes to that particular point, did he, did he after he said that, did he make anything that backed away from that? Chief Justice Kennedy, after he said premeditation is the biggest fact, no, sir, because the, the, the next and final exchange was, so would your, would your vote basically be for death? Yes, it would, and it was minutes later that the trial court denied the cause challenge. Um, so no, he never backed up. That's where he ended. Um, and I think that's a critical point. Um, I think Counsel, I'm sorry to interrupt you, I, and I appreciate what you're saying, but could you help us understand, though, how do we apply our competent substantial evidence standard, given, you know, what you and Justice Kennedy have just talked about, where, you know, he didn't back away from the statement at the end, but there were the other statements. Given what we've said about, you know, needing to defer to the trial court having been there, and given that in, in a normal case, if there's evidence pointing in both directions, which I think it's fair to say that that's true here, yes, sir. if we look at the record and there's evidence that would support what the trial court did, you know, that's kind of the end of the inquiry. I mean, it sounds like you're almost, it sounds like you, we would either have to back away from that standard or we'd have to be applying it here in a way that we don't apply it in any other context. Yes, sir. Well, Justice Muniz, I would say this. Yeah, and I believe Dosh versus State, this court stated, and it was quoting, I believe, the group versus Sheffield, and it said that competent substantial evidence is evidence that's sufficiently relevant and material for a reasonable mind to accept it as adequate to support the conclusion reached. And here the conclusion reached would be that there's no reasonable doubt that Mr. Henderson was impartial. And I think to state that more affirmatively, there's no reasonable possibility that he was partial. No reasonable possibility that he possessed an unqualified predisposition to impose death for premeditated but, murder. But if, the problem is, though, we, we seem to be focusing just on that last statement and not on what we need to be doing, which is the entire record. Because if you look at the entire colloquy on this issue, there's a lot there. So for example, the first statement, the first question that's asked to him is actually the ultimate question here. Um, so this is different than a lot of other cases where right off the bat he said, death, 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 death. What he's asked is, sir, do you believe that the person who has been found guilty of, of murder uh, ought, should automatically, the death penalty should automatically be imposed? I would say no. There are going to be other circumstances that I'd like to have full knowledge of. That's his first statement right off the bat. So unlike the situation that, that Justice Labarga talked about, and even then could be rehabilitated, he says the right thing right up front under the law. Then there's some conflict about, well, I would do it if it's premeditated. Then he's educated by the state. There's more questioning. The state goes through and he hears everything else. He says, can you follow the law as you understand it? Yes. Then the, the further asked, do you understand that the death penalty is not automatic and you will listen to and weigh the aggravators and mitigators? And, and, and he confirmed that he could do that. Given, I understand there's other statements, but given that record, how can we say that a trial judge abused its discretion as a matter of law? In other words, no trial judge under the face of the earth could have acted as, in a different way than this trial judge did hearing that record. Justice Luck, 
I, I certainly acknowledge that the trial court is entitled to a large degree of deference and a measure of discretion. I'm simply saying, I, I mean, frankly, I think that if this court finds that the trial court didn't abuse its discretion, it's running the risk of abandoning or abdicating its duty to, to conduct judicial appellate review. I, I, I understand that that was the first statement, but the, the juror immediately clarified, I'd like to know some other circumstances. What circumstances? State of mind at the time of the crime. Well, if it's premeditated and murder. The, and the first statement is, is not inconsistent with the, the ultimate statement either. I mean, the, the statement that he wants to, that it's not automatic, and he wants to consider other things is not inconsistent with the fixation on premeditation. Isn't that correct? Well, I think the first, very first question, Chief Justice Kennedy, was basically if a defendant was convicted of first degree murder, either under a premeditated murder theory or felony murder theory, he says, no, I wouldn't automatically. And then sh within a few questions, it's clear that he's concerned about the state of mind at the time of the crime, premeditation. And when he's told, well, if it was a premeditated murder theory, it'd be premeditated, he says, well, and the defense attorney says, are there any other state of minds you'd like to know? No, if it's premeditated, it's premeditated. So in that instance, would you automatically impose death? I would. Is, is, is a juror yes, who will automatically vote for the death penalty if it's premeditated a qualified juror? No, sir. Is it inconsistent to say what Henderson said at the beginning, which is if someone is convicted, it's not an automatic death penalty, but if it's premeditated, it's automatic for me. Are those necessarily inconsistent? Are they necessarily inconsistent? I mean, it was a general, more general right. question. So there, we, they talked about felony murder, right. and then he said, so if, if, if someone's just convicted, is that an automatic death penalty? No, I need to know other circumstances. Then they explore other circumstances, and he says, well, if it's premeditated, that's automatic. I mean, I don't see those as necessarily even inconsistent. Well, I, I do agree, Justice Lawson. I, I think the, 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 the point would be that under the first question, it was premeditated murder. I mean, I'm sorry, first degree murder under felony murder or a premeditated murder theory. Right. I don't think Justice Henderson would have automatically imposed death under a premeditated murder that's theory. That's not, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, a felony murder counsel, theory. Counsel, that's not quite right because the, the, the way that this is asked is the defense attorney says, someone's been found guilty of, and he lists exactly what they've been found guilty of. But, quote, Basically, someone's been found guilty of first degree murder, premeditated, specific intent, and they killed someone or they killed someone during the commission of a felony or attempted felony, burglary, home invasion, sexual battery. Let me make sure to capture them all. Robbery, kidnapping, the murder of another individual. There's no defense of others. The person is not insane. It's not self-defense. They were able to form a specific intent. So do you believe that person would be found guilty, should be automatic, should automatically be imposed? I would say no. How is that not inconsistent with the later statement about premeditation when premeditation forms the basis of the very question to which he said no? Well, I, I'm saying it's, um, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that the next few questions and answers, Justice Luck, I think make it clear that there's certainly some statements that go the other way. There's no doubt about that. The question I have is where you have some evidence on this side and some evidence on this side, and the trial judge looking, observing, seeing facial expressions, hearing intonation, makes a decision on this side, we would say as a matter of law that's an abuse of discretion. In these particular circumstances, yes, sir. And, 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 wasn't and, the first <laughs> question a compound question, premeditated or during the commission of a felony? Yes, sir. And, and, and my point, the point I'm trying to make, Justice Lawson, is that he, as he clarified that and separated it out, it became clear that if it was premeditated murder, he would automatically impose death. And, and, and I mean, one last point I would want to make on, on, this, on this particular point is that the circumstances here involving juror Henderson are indistinguishable from the circumstances involving the prospective juror. Padgett was his name in this court's decision in Bryant v. State, which is at 602 Southern 2nd, 529. And that's a case, though, where we didn't even talk about the competent substantial evidence standard. I mean, that reads like, that reads as if the, as if the court here was making, putting itself in the position of the trial court and making the same decision almost de novo. Well, Justice Muniz, I acknowledge that the court did not explicitly talk about that. I have to assume that the court was appropriately applying the standard review in that case. One, I mean, one concern that I have reading this, and, and again, I think it goes to what Justice Luck was talking about with the, this kind of superior vantage point of the trial court. There's almost something unfair about asking these jurors 
questions where you don't, know, you don't know what they know about the law and kind of asking them questions in the abstract about what would you do about this or that. Then when they're told, well, actually, under Florida law, you have to consider this and weigh the aggravator and the mitigator or whatever. And if they, in response to that, say, OK, I could follow that law, why, why can the trial court not take that into account and instead have to be bound by what the prospective juror says when they're ignorant about what their actual legal responsibilities are? Yes, sir. Well, I think generally the court can and, and should. I think in this particular case, though, and I, and, I, and I try to lay this out at length in a portion of the reply brief, in this case, prospective juror Henderson was aware of what the law required, particularly by his final answer regarding premeditation being the biggest factor. And I think that's crucial about this case. Again, I think it's the particular facts of this case that, 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 that give rise to it being an abuse of discretion in this particular case. Counsel, yes, sir. Exhausted all your time. Yes, I will uh, nonetheless give you two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Chief Justice Kennedy. Chief Justice Kennedy, Justices of the Court, may it please the Court. My name is Jennifer Donahue, and I'm an Assistant Attorney General. I represent the state in this matter. As far as uh, Juror Henderson, you're correct. We need to look at the entire record. This questioning stemmed from a hypothetical that the defense counsel started with a different juror. In that hypothetical, no, uh, no mitigation was um, given as part of the hypothetical. You just had the facts of, here's what happened. He was found guilty of first degree murder. That juror, Mr. Morrow, responded, that's all you're gonna give me? That's all the facts that I get in order to answer to that hypothetical? And they say yes that's all you're gonna get. Now the state objects about five or six times to this line of questioning because it's confusing. Even the court says it's confusing. Uh, the defense counsel during those objections, sidebars, explains here's where I'm trying to go with this and both the state and the court acknowledge certainly you can go in that direction. You're allowed to ask those questions but that's not how you're asking it here. You're posing a hypothetical with no mitigating circumstances and basically asking what should you do in this circumstance, in this hypothetical that you've given? So it's quite likely that Mr. Henderson was going back to that original hypothetical where there were no mitigating circumstances and saying, yes, I think the death penalty is appropriate in those circumstances. And certainly there's great deference to the trial judge because he gets to see the demeanor of the jurors when these questions are being asked. It's certainly much different if he says, yeah, the premeditation's the biggest factor for me. And if uh, I could not vote for a life sentence, but he might have said, I, I cannot vote for a life sentence. We don't know because this is a cold record. And that's why on appellate review, there's great deference given to the trial judge because he was able to see the jurors' reactions to these questions. And ultimately, we know that the judge felt that this juror could follow the law when he and was he, properly he, instructed though, on it. We, we had all the hypotheticals and what, what if this, what if this, or this, or this, or this, and then there's this, and there's not this, there's not this. Yeah, I'd have to know more. And then there's specific questioning, what's important to you? And he says, state of mind at the time of crime. And then they explore further, well, what do you mean? Well, if he intended it. And then they explore further, and the final, Mr. Henderson says, um, what I want to know is if it's premeditated. It's premeditated. And defense says, and in that case, with the death penalty, would you automatically impose the death penalty? I would. I mean, that is an unequivocal statement that if that circumstance is there, I would impose the death penalty. Now, it might be possible that counsel, the state could have gotten back up and explored that and ex found out that there was some confusion there that he really didn't mean what he said. But how can you take that clear, unequivocal statement that flows from a specific questioning as to what that juror thought was important in the decision to recommend death and say that some generalized statements about all these other hypotheticals somehow negate that. Certainly his, his statement alone is concerning, but. I mean, you would agree that a, a juror who says, a juror who would vote to impose the death penalty based on the finding of premeditation, 
is not qualified to sit as a juror. Right, if they won't okay. consider the mitigation. Okay, that, and that is exactly what he said, you agree. He yes, said it would be automatic. Those were the words used. Yes, but he had previously said it's not automatic. And then the well, he had said it's not automatic in response to these long series of questions. This is here, this is here, maybe this or this. I mean, but, but here we've narrowed it down to what's important to him. And he's specifically said it's automatic if it's premeditated. Without more exploration of that, how can we conclude that that juror is that there, there was, I mean, that any judge would not find that juror to be biased on that record. And I certainly understand your concerns, Justice Lawson, but the question was, in a first degree murder case, a person has specific intent, but the, the, the defense counsel's not asking, would you then not consider mitigation? Uh, he's not going that, that step further. So spe the specific intent is important to you. Does that mean that if the judge instructed you to consider mitigation, you would not consider that mitigation. We don't. We well, don't that, know. Yeah, we don't know. That. On this record, all we know is that this juror unequivocally said that he would vote for death if it was premeditated murder. Yes, in in the specific hypothetical that the defense counsel gave, which did that wasn't not a hypothetical. He was asking him. There was a hypothetical earlier. Yes. Yes, Your Honor. But then he was asking him, "Well, what's important to you?" What do you want to know? Yes, and, and frankly, at this point, the, the juror doesn't know what is important because he hasn't heard any of the evidence. Counsel, let's assume that, that um, the trial court judge committed error by not excusing Mr. Henderson from the, the jury pool. You, in your brief, you uh, asked this court to recede from Trotter. Can you address that? What is, is there prejudice to Mr. Davini by uh, the trial court not striking for cause Mr. Henderson? The case law as it stands, uh, he properly preserved this and there was prejudice because he identified other objectionable jurors. But that term objectionable is vague and, and not quite defined. It's just whatever they had to have been challenged previously. And the objectionable which, jurors are three because one of them did not actually sit on the jury pool. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. And he identified those individuals. So under the current case law, it has been preserved, and this would be reversed if you were to find that the judge abused his discretion. Um, but this is, and it's considered prejudice, but when you compare it to um, prejudice in, in any other sense from this court, uh, there has to be a specific um, prejudice, such as a biased juror sat. And that's the prejudice that should be focused on. Is there a biased juror that sat here? And there certainly is not a biased juror that sat. Um, a defendant's not entitled to the specific jury of his choice. He's uh, entitled to a fair and impartial jury. And if no biased juror sat on this jury, then he had a fair and impartial juror. Jury, just because he felt that, you know, three other jurors were objectionable, uh, that doesn't demonstrate prejudice in the sense that we, um, on appellate review, usually assume prejudice. Um, so like with the uh, Strickland prejudice, you have to demonstrate that it actually caused the error in this case. But so for, for a juror to be biased juror, uh, under your view, uh, the juror would actually have to say, I will be unable to uh, to be fair in this case, uh, if it's a premeditated murder. Right. Actually have to come out and say that. No, they don't have to actually come out and say it. It well, has to be clear that, that, from... Then we're getting into the gray area. Yes, and there's always gray area, and that's why there's deference to the trial court to make that determination, because they can see more than we can from a cold appellate record. But I think, I mean, I think part of the question is, is are you saying for there to be prejudice, would the cause standard have to be met? Yes. Okay, so... That the biased juror would have had to have sat. So isn't... I understand what you're saying about the normal way that we think of prejudice, but it really does undermine the value of the peremptories if there is essentially no harm, no foul, is what you're saying. Absolutely. And Mr. So, Mr. But, Henderson didn't sit on this jury. He was at home. So what, where does that leave, though, the value of the peremptory challenges? Well, certainly peremptory challenges are valuable, and originally they were intended to take care of issues like this. If a judge abuses his discretion, then you get a peremptory challenge so that you can challenge that individual and they're not on your jury. Or 
for things that uh, you're not able to articulate on the record that wouldn't constitute uh, a bias, such as, you know, that juror, I didn't get a good vibe from that juror. But in the capital context, there are 10 peremptory challenges. So the fact that he had to use one of his 10 on this one juror who the judge didn't think was biased, it, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't sit well with our traditional sense of what reversible prejudice is. It's almost a per se rule. You just have to preserve, hey, I don't like these three other people, and now you're gonna get a per se reversal just because the biased juror that you're claiming was biased didn't even sit on your jury. It's, it's a strange notion. And that's why the federal rule is that you actually had to have had a biased juror sit on your panel in order to uh, demonstrate reversible prejudice. And, and, I, and I guess a lot of it sort of depends on where the juror seated. Um, if, if in this case we determine that Henderson was a biased juror, and if the defense had used all their all ten peremptories before they got to him, and then were forced to accept him, ask for an additional peremptory, and it wasn't given, and he sat on the jury, then there would be entitlement to relief under federal or state law. Correct. Correct. So, but. Okay. Because that bias juror actually sat. Right. And, you know, the defendant might have wanted jurors 101, 102, 103, but we didn't get to those jurors. You don't get the jury of your choice. You just get a fair and impartial jury. If there are no further questions, this court should affirm the sentence in this case. Thank you. If I could, I'd like to make two brief points regarding the merits and then address Trotter, receding from Trotter. Um, first of all, on pages four through five of the reply brief, uh, it discusses at length the, the, the points in the record where Mr. Henderson was advised and reminded of his the duties that capital jurors have to perform. Um, that's lengthy. The other thing I would point out is that in Caratelli and in many other cases, this court has said that ambiguities and uncertainties as to a juror's impartiality should be resolved in favor of exclusion. Now, regarding whether this court should recede from Trotter, assuming it decides the merits in Mr. Devaney's favor, even if Trotter is erroneous, the strong presumption in favor of this court abiding by its own precedent has not be, been overcome. I, and I'd like to discuss that a little bit more if I could, but I'd also want to point out that even if this court, that strong presumption was overcome and this court receded from Trotter, the burden would be on the state as the beneficiary of the error to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the error did not contribute to the jury's determination here that death was appropriate. But, but the key point I want to make with regard to Trotter is, Trotter is a 30-year-old decision that was unanimous in relevant part, that was reaffirmed in cop show over the very same argument advanced here and reaffirmed a second time, um, I'm sorry, reaffirmed in Busby to begin with and then reaffirmed again in cop show over the exact same argument. And, and so, as we all know, just because a, a, a decision may be erroneous, there, there's, there's many other showings that have to be made for a court to say, I'm going to recede from, it, from, from our own precedent. And here, I don't think the Trotter standard has proven um, unworkable due to a reliance on a judicial fiction. I, don't, I believe that if this court was to recede from Trotter, which applies not only in criminal cases but civil cases, it would lead to a serious disruption in the law. And I think finally the factual premises underlying Trotter have not changed so drastically as to leave its central holding utterly without justification. And so if I could end by saying um, one reason that there's a strong presumption in favor of stare decisis is that abiding by precedent contributes to not only the actual but the perceived legitimacy of the judicial process and, and the risk posed by receding from precedent of negatively impacting the perceived um, legitimacy of the judicial process, that risk increases to the extent that a decision is firmly established. Here, Trotter is firmly established. That history reinforces the already strong presumption in favor of abiding by it rather receding from Trotter. And I'd ask this court to reverse on issue one. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you uh, both.